Well, good. Why don't we why don't we begin? And um, uh, I'm John Henry, uh, chairman of the Committee for the Republic. 234 years ago, history's greatest assemblage of political wisdom gathered under one roof in Philadelphia. The resulting miracle midwifed the nation's birth certificate, the, the United States Constitution. The, the 55 uh, delegates in Philadelphia uh, at the Constitutional Convention uh, confronted civilization's most elusive and dawning challenge, how to diffuse power to secure justice against the sleepless forces of tyranny. The greatest tyranny finds expression in the armored knight, valorized in the pages of romance and poetry for proficiency in legalized first degree murder, otherwise known as war. But that's for a, a separate salon. That's not our subject tonight. Among the <clears throat> 55 delegates, a single youth uh, displayed an intellectual luster that eclipsed all others. At age 36, James Madison was no ivory tower academic. He learned from doing, from reading, and from reflecting. He had witnessed the incorrigible depraved nature of the political animal in the Virginia legislature as well as in the Continental Congress. He had mastered every experiment in government that invariably concluded an executive oppression since the beginning of time. Mr. Madison engineered the Constitution separation of powers. Separation of powers is the most enlightened idea in the history of statecraft. It pits ambition against ambition and repudiates reliance on personalities. Separation of powers allows the rule of law and freedom to flourish. Sadly, uh, today, separation of powers is on life support. The prime culprits are congressional abdication and judicial faint-heartedness. My uh, committee co-founder, uh, Boyden Gray, uh, is a leading authority on uh, non-delegation doctrine and the obligation of Congress to discharge, not shirk, its constitutional responsibilities. The oath of office and the prohibition of perjury require no less. Boyden, I'm going to hand it over for you. To you, it's all yours. Um, a really extraordinary violation of the central principle that John just described: separation of powers. Why is that such an extraordinary violation when you have it? Um, because you, what's happened here is all three branches have been in too many cases across the economy, uh, rolled into one set of agencies in the executive branch. And that's the very definition of tyranny to be judiciary, legislative, and executive. But that's what we have for much of our economy. And that explains why we have such uh, wealth gaps, why we have such, um, such, such a bad economy, why people can't find jobs, it's, it's, it's killing innovation. We're falling way behind to the, with the Chinese, to the Chinese. And this is the real reason. Now, what's happened is, is that Congress has just let, um, has just delegated much of its authority, legislative authority, to unelected bureaucrats in the executive branch. Um, nominally, I suppose, affordable to the president, but that's not even true uh, in uh, some cases. Uh, but in any case, as a practical matter, the president can't, can't stop it um, without some legislative help from Congress and the courts. And the result is a, is a um, massive uh, symbiotic sort of partnership between ever-growing ever bureaucracies in the executive branch uh, uh, feeding off of and feeding the ever-growing uh, mon monopoly power entities, or at least uh, oligopoly power entities in the private sector. You could say this is, uh, was uh, 
Woodrow Wilson's dream of experts in the executive branch deciding everything. Certainly it was the dream of many of the German philosophers in the first part of uh, the latter part of the, eight, the 19th century, but it's very, very dangerous. And I'll give some examples in a minute. So I so try to make it um, practically realistic for you. But it's complicated by the fact that the way the system works, we think the courts may fix this, we hope they will. But the way the system works is if there's any ambiguity in a congressional uh, statute, and believe me, lawyers can find ambiguity in any word uh, you can dream of. If there's any ambiguity that is taken as a delegation to the, to the, uh, to the agency, to the bureaucrats to resolve uh, the ambiguity in whichever way they think is most reasonable. And if it is reasonable, the courts are required to, by the current doctrine, which needs to be changed, by the current doctrine of the Supreme Court, the courts are required to defer to the agencies on what is usually a question of law. And this is also unconstitutional. It violates also the statute that governs the behavior of all these agencies, which requires that courts decide the law. That's one of the few things, great things that came out of Marbury versus Madison, where Chief Justice John, uh, John Marshall said it's emphatically the, the duty of the judicial department to declare what the law is. But it's at the moment, agencies declare what the law is and decide it and have actually have the power to overrule uh, courts, which is for someone who's not um, Senate confirmed or elected by the public is really quite an extraordinary uh, power. Now, the requirement of, of um, deferring to agencies' interpretation of what a statute says is a result of a case called Chevron decided in the early 80s. It wasn't really meant to be this way, but it has been expanded and expanded and expanded to the point where as I say, Congress now is told what to do by its own bureaucracy uh, and, and not vice versa. And the courts are supposed to go along because they have to, uh, they have to go along with it. And this suits the big business people fine. I'm gonna go through some examples in a minute, but uh, one of them, and I'll repeat it just for emphasis sake. Um, it is, it is a, a, known, a known sort of secret in financial circles that Goldman Sachs, his real name is government Sachs. And that stems from the fact that they know how to, how to work the deal and they, they have a revolving door between themselves and, and the New York Fed and the National Fed, Federal Reserve Board. And that's why it's known as government Sachs. Uh, Jamie Dimon, who's chairman of JP Morgan, refers to the Dodd-Frank law, which was designed to curb bank, banking and financial excesses after the, the collapse in 2008. Um, he, he calls Dodd-Frank his moat. By that, I mean his M-O-T-E, not M-O-T-E in his eye, his M-O-A-T, his, his, his little uh, river around his castle uh, to protect him from competition from pesky Pesky little ba littler bats. Um, when you see on the advertisements, which I see all the time, maybe it's because I watch too much Fox, but um, Facebook is running a, a, a very, very interesting campaign begging for regulation. They're acknowledging that they don't get things necessarily right. So they say, throw us in that briar patch, please, regulate us. Well, of course, what they're going to do is write the regulation to protect them from competition. Now this trick of asking government to write a regulation to protect the public when, it, when it actually what you're doing is writing a regulation to protect you from competition from the public is as old as Adam Smith. It's been, it was his great worry, his nightmare. So this is 300 years old, it's not anything new. Uh, it's a subject of a, of a discipline in the law called public choice theory, and it's known sometimes colloquially as agency capture, but the agency is captured by the industry is supposed to be regulated. But that is what happens, and we have this, this really uh, tyrannical uh, situation 
Um, in so many areas of our economy, it's frightening. And I'll start with one. I did. John rightly said we're not going to talk about the war powers here. And this is the administrative state is, I always like to distinguish, uh, separate from the deep state, which is the collaboration and, and, and collusion of all the intelligence states. Um, but that is an example of what we're talking about. Uh, certainly a, a, a better example in the foreign policy arena, which we won't, which I'm not going to spend much time on, is the military industrial complex. That was a phrase coined by Eisenhower in his last um, address to the American people. And he was terrified of this. And he was terrified of mixing science with it because it would politicize science. Well, that's where we are right now. And I'll go into that more in a minute. But, but start with the military industrial complex, uh, the revolving door between the admirals and generals and the Pentagon and you know, Northern Virginia. And you see why Northern Virginia is such a, was before the last election, such a blue state, but even education can, maybe education can, can uh, and has maybe changed that a bit. Another example is Boeing. Boeing uh, sort of dominating the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, cutting corners right and left, FAA let him get by with it. And so we have a 737 problem that goes on for years and Boeing is losing, losing a lot of traction to, uh, to Airbus. And it's not good for our country, it's just plain not good. Then we have the Food and Drug Administration, which may be uh, the worst offender of all. And we have you know, this op opioid crisis, which started with the FDA uh, being dominated by, uh, by uh, these drug companies uh, to push opioids. And they were pushing it on everybody. When I had surgery at uh, Johns Hopkins about seven or eight years ago, um, they, were, they, were, they were trying to cram these op opioids down my throat. There was nothing, I mean, I couldn't, I, I would have had to do anything to get bottles and bottles and bottles of it. It's just, that it was really frightening. I wasn't in any pain. Why were they trying to feed me the opioids? Well, I get addicted and I'd bid some more drugs. Well, that has not been very good to the Sackler family and they've had to pay tens of billion dollars in fines to get out of this mess. But that's an example of where the FDA um, said, okay, big pharma, go to it. You can have it. Um, financial services, uh, I've mentioned already, Jamie Dimon, his moat. Uh, one of the great examples is the, that, come out of, that came out of uh, Dodd-Frank is the thing called the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. It's answerable to no one, not even the President of the United States. That's been changed now by, by a court uh, decision in the Supreme Court, which is what gives me hope that they're going to continue with this this slight revision, slight reform. Well, it's not slight, it's, it's meaningful. Uh, but but uh, when the CFPB was called to testify, and they don't have to testify since they're paid out of the Fed's money printing operation, not by the Congress. Uh, so Congress really has no control over it. Uh, but see, but, but the first head, Cordray, did go and testify or agree to testify. And one of the questions he was asked was uh, who Whose idea was it? Who, who paid for? Um, why? What was the? Who was behind this two hundred fifty million dollar uh, um, reform of your uh, renovation of your headquarters? And his answer was, "What does it matter to you?" It's about the one. That's one of the most insubordinate things I've ever heard anybody. I mean, my daughter was never that insubordinate to me, and I don't think I or my three brothers were ever that in subordinate to my uh, parents. But anyway, that's about as insubordinate, I think, as you, you can get. Then we have the teacher unions. We've been through that for those who follow the Virginia election. The teacher unions control, um, control the teachers. Uh, they control the school boards. They control so much. That's why school choice is all of a sudden catching on. And I hope it goes much bigger than it has. Um, and then there's big tech. Uh, as I mentioned, Facebook is looking to expand its power by 
getting uh, hand hand crafted regulation to cost it from its potential uh, potential uh, competitors, but they're constantly uh, deplatforming uh, ideas and statements and facts that don't fit with their with their ideology, which is quite left to center. And my favorite example of that is the two times they have recently, this is YouTube, not Facebook, but YouTube, uh, defenestrated Senator Ron Johnson. He held two duly constituted hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, perfectly normal by the book. Um, one was on the therapies, which I'll get into in a minute, the non-drug therapies, I mean the non big pharma therapies for, for COVID. And then later he had a hearing uh, with 15 so witnesses who had suffered severe uh, reactions to the vaccine, which has killed, my surprise you to know this, killed 18,000 people, uh, the vaccines have. Um, saved a lot more lives than that, I understand, but that's still a, a number that, that should wake people up. Um, those two hearings were posted on YouTube and then YouTube took them down. So you can't, you can't see these hearings. You can't get your, you can't get access to them. But that is what happened uh, with, um, uh, with COVID, which I'll come back to as sort of my closing uh, poster child. Then there is um, the ESG, the Environmental Social Governance movement uh, led by BlackRock. Uh, BlackRock and Vanguard and Fidelity control um, $15 trillion of the US economy, $15 trillion. BlackRock is now somehow, I think, gonna let some of its uh, investors, pension funds and whatnot, vote their own shares rather than having BlackRock vote them. But BlackRock is, is on a to, to impose a draconian climate change um, behavior uh, uh, on every on every company in America, um, and the, the real danger of that, of course, is that his extreme measures aren't aren't really uh, cost beneficial now. Let let me more research run for a few more years, and we'll get a much cheaper and more effective response to climate change. Um, but the worst danger is that he is deeply, deeply uh, invested in China and his movement, his ESG movement, which is getting lots of traction, uh, is, uh, is gonna push back to China all these jobs that we're trying to retrieve. And uh, that's gonna make him unbelievably richer than he already is. Uh, but it's but it's gonna it's just gonna hollow out America, which happened in the past, and we're trying to change that. But but this is this is gonna reverse it if we can't find a way to uh, to fix it. He's he's gonna count on the SEC writing regulations uh, that will that will and the Fed to write regulations to force uh, climate change behavior in his direction, and not notwithstanding the Supreme Court's um, emphatic uh, uh, decision as of not too many years ago saying that the only agency that really now absent any further uh, action by Congress, the only uh, agency that has a right to boss anybody around is the Environment Protection Agency. And that doesn't seem to bother, bother him. And I'll sort of close this discussion with uh, at least my part of it with uh, COVID, which is, which is really one of the great, I think, one of the great scandals um, of all time in this country. And we have the benefit of these vaccines, which have helped, no question about it. Uh, for me, at my age group, there is no question about it. I've been thrice vaxxed. Um, I know the, 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 the immunity or the protection is going to wear out at some point. And then I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't want another shot because every more, every additional shot you get, 
the worse you suffer from the from the adverse consequences of the of the injection. But um, in order to get these vaccines onto the market, which is I think given Pfizer you know, thirty five billion dollars in in profits over the last sort of eighteen months, it's a lot of money. Um, in order to get these shots into the market without formal approval and using the emergency use, use authorization, which is a technical term the FDA uses when they don't really know what they're doing. They don't really have final um, data. Uh, you can't use an EUA, as it's called, unless if there are uh, therapies available to treat whatever disease or virus you're targeting. And so uh, the FDA had to uh, effectively ban two very, very promising therapies that are being used all over the world, um, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. The latter uh, suffered a blow when Trump unwisely uh, trumpeted it as a, as a possible therapy and that killed it. The one of the that killed it, but the FDA finished it off. And uh, there's a guy named Harvey Risch, professor of the epidemiology at Yale S S School of Public Health, who calculates that the de demonstrating those two therapies uh, may have cost several hundred thousand lives in America alone, forget the world. Now, it might surprise you to know that these drugs, which you really basically are, are hard to find, you can't get. One of my doctors told me if he prescribed hydroxychloroquine, then he'd be he lose his license, uh, which, which is ridiculous because it was approved 60 years ago. It's been taken by billions of people. It's very, very safe. It's used as a malaria drug in Africa. And uh, the other drug, ivermectin, was embedded. The guy won a Nobel Peace Prize for this, or, or, or Prize in Economics, uh, just a few years ago. It's used to treat river blindness in Africa very successfully. But the, but the FDA said, come on, guys, cut it out. This is, this is very unprofessional for an agency to say that. Come on, y'all, cut it out. You're not a cow or a horse. Because the FDA is arguing that it's only a veterinary medicine, which is, which is just totally, totally false. So uh, you can get these drugs over the counter uh, very, very cheaply uh, because they're, they're out of patent, off-label, approved, but they don't cost anything. Um, you can get them anywhere in the world, but in the United States. The largest, um, what happened in India with this COVID uh, violation was a uh, COVID uh, disaster, was to delegate treatment to the states and hope that some sort of competition, laboratories of democracy like we have here with our federalism, might come up with an answer. And their largest state is Uttar Pradesh, 200 million people, not as big as the United States, but pretty damn big. And they have the lowest vaccination rate in India. And it might surprise you to hear the lowest case rate, the lowest death rate. How can that be? Well, because they flooded, the, flooded their state with ivermectin and it has kept the, uh, kept the uh, COVID at bay. It is also true because ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are ubiquitous in, in Africa, that's not uh, a total coincidence that Africa has the lowest death and case rate of any continent in the world. Now, part of the explanation for that is that they have a young population. They don't have old farts like me wandering around, uh, too many of us, but um, still the, the, the dramatically lower rate has to have some linkage to the use of these two therapies. What the FDA did and getting rid of these therapies was, was to approve remdesivir, which is a very dangerous drug, um, and it has gone nowhere, but, but, but FDA approved that and uh, basically uh, wiped out these other therapies. They're, they're also now in the position of arguing that, uh, that, there, that there really is no <laughs> national immunity, not worth talking about. Uh, the reality is CDC announced under some pressure over the weekend, you won't read about it because it won't be in the papers, 
uh, that they do not have a single example of any transmission of COVID by a person who had who had the virus and and and, and recovered. Uh, there just are no cases of reinfection. But you read an article that's in the current Atlantic Monthly, and you'll read that uh, natural immunity uh, uh, protection is far less uh, far less successful than uh, than the vaccines. But the data, which they, they supply no data to back that up, no footnotes, no nothing. But the data out of Israel says that natural immunity from a COVID a case is 27 times more protective than uh, the vaccines. I could go on at great length about this, except that I do think it's only fair to say that uh, at the beginning of November, Bill Gates, who's been in league with with Fauci for about 20 years now, uh, finding a way to find vaccines for everything, never known thing that you might encounter, um, said in London, quote, we've got vaccines that help you with your health, but only slightly reduce the transmission. And then on November 12th, Dr. Fauci told the New York Times in a podcast, although they have not rebroadcast it or reprinted it in their newspaper, they are seeing a waning of, of immunity, not only against infection, but against hospitalization and to some extent death, which is starting now to now involve all age groups. Well, that's, that's a very reassuring thing to, uh, to hear. So um, there are these therapies, there is monoclonal, there are monoclonal antibodies, which are very, very effective. Um, I believe probably, probably bulletproof. Um, Pfizer, I think now has, they're about to ask for approval for a pill. It doesn't protect you against, but it does, it does uh, reduce the chance of hospitalization. So they say. But we should have had these therapies uh, uh, available um, to the American public for the last two years, and we haven't. And that, to me, is an extraordinary uh, uh, dereliction of, of the public trust. So I'll stop there, um, John, and I'll answer any questions. Anybody, you know, I'm sure there are people think I'm crazy to talk this way, but uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is okay. this is the way I see it. Terrific. Uh, uh, we've got Peter Wallace and has joined us from uh, Colorado. Well, Peter is, um, um, knows a great deal about, you've got a, a book coming out on delegation doctrine. Uh, uh, Peter, you want to tell us about that? Hey now? Got yeah, great. Um, it was very good of Boyden to mention Chevron uh, because while people talk about the, uh, in, the, the, uh, Delegation problem, non-delegation issue. Um, Chevron is equal to that, very similar to that, and it has to be dealt with by the courts too. Now we do have uh, AEI. I'm affiliated with AEI. I'm a senior fellow emeritus there, and I and John Yu uh, uh, are publishing a book, probably in late December, early January on the non-delegation doctrine. I wrote one in 2018. It's actually still around if you'd like to get it. Everyone on, on, <laughs> everyone on uh, Fox News shows his book, so I might as well show it. <laughs> um, but uh, that book was about the non-delegation problem and, and issue, and uh, that's why I've volunteered at uh, AEI with John Yu to uh, do another book because the Supreme Court never did resolve the non-delegation question fully. It had a great opportunity a couple of years ago in a case called Gundy, um, where unfortunately, uh, Justice Kavanaugh had not been confirmed in time. Uh, so they only had eight people uh, on the panel, and the liberals uh, wrote their piece. Uh, not all the conservatives <laughs> did. Uh, Justice Alito did not join any side, uh, but that was a four to three, uh, saying that uh, the Congress had not violated the non-negation doctrine. Uh, 
So they're still looking for a case where the non-delegation doctrine can be fully treated. And in order to encourage the court to do that, uh, John, you and I have uh, uh, written a book, actually edited a book with, in which 10 legal scholars from a number of law schools uh, have written about the non-delegation issue and why it's important and how the court can uh, deal with it well and successfully. And that book will be out and in the first week in January. And we're very lucky that the court has now accepted a case, uh, which is called West Virginia versus the um, uh, the uh, EPA. EPA. West Virginia versus EPA. And that case does raise again the non delegation issue. So we're lucky. Our book will be coming out first part of January. We are then going to distribute it free of charge um, to anyone who wants a copy. We don't have time. This case, case came up so quickly that we weren't, uh, we weren't prepared to have the book completed in hardback. So we're going to have paperbacks that AEI will distribute all around Washington and all around the United States uh, so people can be informed about what the non-delegation problem is about. But I want to just say that uh, it is important that Chevron be thought of as part of this, and I'll get to that in just a second. Let me just complete the, the business uh, on the non-delegation problem. What, what this idea is, and it has been part of our constitutional doctrine since the Constitution was, was adopted because it is something that is a natural result of the separation of powers in our Constitution. That is the thing that really distinguishes our Constitution from all other constitutions, at least at the time ours was adopted. And what it says is that there are three different powers, there's judicial, there's legislative, and there is executive. And the legislative power must remain with Congress. If the legislative power is allowed to, to uh, seep over into the executive branch, and it does largely through these administrative agencies that have multiplied in this country enormously and, and make about 3,000 regulations every year. If, the, if those are actually lawmaking um, that was not authorized by Congress, then our Constitution is essentially meaningless, at least in terms of its separation of powers. So the non-delegation doctrine is just what it says. You, Congress may not delegate its authority. But why is it important right now to have the non-delegation doctrine imposed. And I think the reason is, and we have this in, in my book, um, Congress has failed to act like a legislature. It's afraid to act as a legislature. The issues are complicated, and when they vote on them, they are jeopardizing their reelection. So Congress has gradually been passing um, important powers off to administrative agencies. And in many cases, they sort of set goals for the agencies. And if the agency meets the goal, well, then Congress can take credit for that. But that is in legislation. That is allowing the agency to legislate. And so the non-delegation doctrine, if the Supreme Court will finally get through it um, and, and decide a case on this basis, and they have this opportunity coming up um, with this case that will be heard in probably late in January, that's the West Virginia case, um, if they then articulate the non-delegation doctrine as it should be uh, articulated and imposed, that will have the effect of forcing Congress to get down to making the actual laws and deciding the policies for this country. And that's what the legislature is supposed to do. Let me say one more word about um, 
the the um, Chevron case because no one talks about that anymore. There hasn't been a case before the Supreme Court in years on Chevron, but Chevron is exactly like the non-delegation doctrine because it says, uh, this is amazing actually, it's a judge made rule by the Supreme Court in 1984. And they said, when you, when, when an executive branch agency uh, is given power, but ambiguous power uh, in, in any area that it's supposed to have responsibility for, if it's ambiguous, the agency has the authority to interpret what its statutory powers are. And that was a direction for all the courts lower down um, to allow the agencies to get away with anything. So it's not even going to be useful to impose the non-delegation doctrine um, unless the Supreme Court, it has to do it in another case, but unless the Supreme Court does the same thing with, the, with, with Chevron, as it was doing with the non-delegation doctrine, and that is saying the courts interpret what the powers are for uh, uh, administrative agencies, not the agencies themselves. So that's all I want to say now, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. So, so uh, we've got a, a number of questions, but I wanted to uh, uh, just stay with the thought there that, uh, so uh, your book on judicial fortitude, basically, you got into this and, the, you know, the hope is that the courts will, will uh, breathe uh, uh, life back into um, uh, delegation doctrine and it will have an intelligible principle. Uh, I remember uh, our board member, Paul Horn, took me to a uh, um, I won't mention the law firm, but one of the big law firms <clears throat> in the country. And we went into a conference room and they basically got up and, and said that the good news is that uh, uh, only half the law has been passed. And, and so basically, uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, you know, if you sit at the table where you're uh, which is going to affect you. And there were 12 different tables. And they said, now, the good news is they're not four or 40, but they're 400 studies. And we can uh, do these studies and we can make this law in your image. So it was quite, uh, quite something to behold. So um, I've never seen a more graphic example of delegation doctrine crying out. Uh, so they basically are passing these laws that don't have any standards that go forth and do good and uh, they're not doing their job. So that's, um, now, what is the probability of the courts or the American voters, you know, but, you know, the Constitution gives 18 enumerated powers to the, the Congress, right? And so what is the probability of either the voters not voting for Democrats or Republicans or anyone who doesn't insist on their representatives, you know, exercising the 18 enumerated powers that are given them, or uh, the Supreme Court uh, coming in, as you as you're saying, and, and taking a test case. Bruce, you're the you're the guru on this. What what's the probability analysis? Well, let me. Oh, we know this start. case. Oh, wait a minute. But, yes. um, yes. oh, dude, go ahead, Peter. I'll co co follow. You. No, I'm just. I was just going to repeat what I said before, and that is, we we do have a case now before the Supreme Court, and um, that will come up in January, probably after probably the 21st, 23rd of January. Where they are asked to whether the powers that were given to the um, uh, EPA were sufficiently detailed in one particular area for ETA, EPA to act on it. And so that's a, it's a non-delegation case. And that's why we're trying to get our books out and so forth, get the, 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 one, the AEI book out so that people will have a chance to think about it and know what the alternatives are and what the, um, what, what the um, non-delegation doctrine actually does. So I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I just wanted to finish. Uh, well, a couple of uh, preface, prefatory remarks before I get into some more substance, but it's kind of ironic that the Chevron doctrine that, that you and, and Boyden have criticized was uh, created by Justice Antonin Scalia. Um, yeah. a very well, it was not, it was Justice Stevens who did it, sorry. No. <laughs> I don't think so. National Resources Defense Council, 
Uh, Chevron I, case was decided by, written by Stevens. Well, I don't know. Well, I'd ask, I'd ask um, Peter to vote on that. He's written well, about it. <laughs> Boyden is correct, but it was a unanimous decision of the court. Uh, Scalia was not yet on the court, but you're correct in the sense that Scalia became the most uh, strong supporter for the Chevron doctrine on the court until just before he unfortunately left the court. It seems to me that, that the Chevron doctrine anyway can be cured not only by reversing the decision, but Congress could direct the judiciary to make independent determinations and eliminate the deference to agency interpretations of its own statute. Um, that clearly is within the prerogative of Congress that they don't do. And the delegation problem is more than just the legislative one. I think as Boyden pointed out, you have at these agencies a delegation of judicial authority too. So they play judge, jury, prosecutor. Uh, they decide whether or not they issue the regulation, they decide whether there's infraction and then they adjudicate it. So that's, that's an equal problem is you're, you're delegating adjudicatory authority as well. Um, and one of the problems I believe that the court will confront in addressing the delegation problem is that it's endured for so long, I think that they may, may balk at the idea that literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of regulations would be upset. And they'll say, well, Congress can repeal them or revoke your, your, your remedy is a political remedy, not a judicial remedy. I mean, that's, that in some sense, I remember, and I think maybe Boyden in early years of the Reagan administration, we thought maybe we could get rid of independent agencies from a decision 1936 on Humphrey's executor. The court just box said, no, they, they weren't going to go that far. Too many independent agencies had cropped up and they weren't going to make that kind of wrench, you know, in the, in the bureaucracy, if you will. And it's hard to see if you actually have any teeth in the delegation doctrine ruling of a court, why they wouldn't shrink at the idea, this is going to be an upheaval uh, and say, this is a political question. Um, I think that also that there are huge institutional incentives that are almost insurmountable uh, that causes Congress to give away all of its legislative authority. They don't want to decide. Boyden points out they don't want to create an issue for a primary campaign. It's much easier for them to delegate it and then if it goes awry, they then criticize the agency and then they get campaign contributions for trying to intercede and cure an agency mess. And then they say, this is great, the best of all possible worlds. We don't have to be accountable for anything. Uh, and we're able then to be more powerful because now uh, we oversee uh, even a bigger bureaucracy. And that's why it grows every single year, whether it's Republican or Democrat. Uh, maybe there's a, 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 in a few instances, a few regulations are repealed, but you know, it's minuscule in comparison to the growth of the regulations. Uh, and I do think that the only way you're gonna stop the delegation uh, is when you have, you make it a political issue and the voters say, we want, we want to vote for members who are actually gonna exercise their authority so we have access to them and we can complain to them. Boyden points out, how do you complain for a bureaucrat? You don't even know their name. You don't have email addresses. You can't walk into their offices. You, at least you could do that with Congress before COVID. And I hope it returns that way. Um, and to that extent, it requires a change in our political culture uh, if we're going to, in a meaningful way, uh, end this utterly ridiculous delegation, run riot, and, and basically we're having a rule by government decree. Uh, All right, and Bruce, let me, respond, let me respond to what, you're, what you said here, because there are a couple of things that I want to just point out. I'm going to the little boys' room while you all get out. <laughs> One is that... Um, uh, the, we have several of the articles in the book that I was talking about, uh, which talk about whether a, a non-delegation decision would upset all of the other regulations that are out there. And Judge Ginsburg, who was one of the writers uh, for the book, uh, Doug Ginsburg, who's in the, he was retired from the DC circuit, but he's still active there. Um, he wrote a piece 
uh, which says that uh, the courts can can adopt a non-delegation doctrine and there are ways for the agencies to deal with that. Um, they deal they can go directly to Congress they can they can get Congress to write laws that give them the power that uh, they're afraid they don't have anymore things like that um, that can that can circumvent any problems that are created by the non-delegation doctrine so, uh, maybe it will have that effect. That'll certainly be one of the things the liberals will all say that you're going to destroy the government. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Kagan, Justice Kagan said exactly that in the Gundy case, that if, if we go ahead and just decide a, a non-delegation case like this, as the, as the conservatives want, um, that's the end of constitutional system in the United States. It's, it's wrong, I think, and the government has the resources to to address that. And there are two or three other articles in that book that take it up from a different perspective and explain how uh, a non-delegation doctrine can be adopted without um, interfering seriously with the way the government functions. Also, one more point, and that is on the on the Chevron case. Um, Scalia was the most powerful advocate for Chevron while he was on the court. And he was great in all other respects, but Chevron was something he supported fully. He had a huge dispute, open dispute, with uh, the Chief Justice in, in a case called City of Arlington. And at that time, um, he said he, he said that three members of the court were going to be attacking the Chevron doctrine. Watch out for them. That's what they're trying to do. But in the next case that came up, which was called the Perez case, in that case, he joined the, the chief justice and several other justices against Chevron by saying the Administrative Procedure Act mandates that the courts have to make the decisions about the powers of the agencies. And that's why we haven't had much, much Chevron litigation going on in the last several years, because now uh, the agencies are afraid to claim Chevron too much because it'll get up to the Supreme Court. And it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court is now ready to overturn Chevron. Can I, can I, John, can I make a couple of comments before you open it up? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, 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 a little defensive Scalia. Um, as I think as you were just saying that at the very end, he was singing a different tune. But in one of the cases, it's going to be, I think, probably heavily cited in the uh, current case you're talking about, too. West Virginia case, um, he has this wonderful line where uh, he, he, he wrote, wrote the decision and uh, threw out what EPA was proposing. And he said, it must have taken, I, I don't know, it's just what classic uh, Scaliaism, we're not going to sit idly by on the dock and wave goodbye to EPA as it embarks on its voyage of discovery. So he, he was. And then, you, as you know, Peter, there was, and, and Bruce, there, there, there is a sibling of, of uh, uh, maybe a first cousin sibling, I don't know, pretty close, uh, doctrine called the Our Doctrine, which is, which is basically the same thing as Chevron yeah. dealing with agency rules. And in one case that came up to the Supreme Court that is a progeny of, of, of Our, and the court you know, threw it out, basically, not as vigorously as it should have, probably, but um, our wasn't actually being decided, but it was being heavily criticized in some of the argument. And after the argument, you know, this is a famous story, uh, but, but the audience should hear it. Uh, he leans over after the argument, he leans over to Justice Thomas and says, you know, Clarence, that our decision, I think is the worst decision ever rendered by the Supreme Court. And Thomas responded, I feel your pain, Nino, you wrote it. 
<laughs> so uh, I think I think that uh, the other thing I would say, Peter, about the about uh, it's, it's it's the two are joined at the hip. Chevron uh, delegation, as as you both of us have said, but if if you have a non delegation issue. Um, the court recognizes that that's an exception to Chevron. In other words, they don't they don't defer to the agency. The agency has nothing to say of how to how to resolve um, a non delegation question that's posed uh, to the court, and that's happened once or twice, you know, and it'll happen again. But uh, they, they too are sort of joined to that. Yeah, as you that's know. right. How, how would you deal with the delegation of the judicial power to these agencies in their adjudicatory role? Well, they've already done it, Bruce, several times. There's King B. Bur Burwell and there's, you know, uh, the tobacco case, Brown and Williamson, and there's UR, you know, the case I'm talking about that's going to be cited a lot. The, the, the court has grappled already with, with Chevron. There's this, you know, the major issues exception and there's the, you know, non-delegation exception and um, what I worry about with the Michigan case is it's so clear that it's a misconstruction of the statute. The statute is, is very clear. It's not, there's nothing ambiguous about it at all. That the court might not be able to reach the constitutional issue because you're not supposed to reach them if you don't have to. Now, they can easily say this is a total misreading of the statute. That's been one of the things that worries me about that case. It's a great opportunity for them, but they may, but there are others that are in the pipeline. Believe me, there are others in the pipeline. And they're going to get to this, and they're going to fix it. In my well, opinion. you go to Crowell and Benson, where the court said you can delegate uh, some adjudicatory power to agencies that are entitled to deference. It never has explicitly has, has stated what's the demarcation line between uh, what judicial authority can be delegated to administrative agencies and what is inherent Article Three authority. That's a huge problem, in, in my judgment. Um, because these agencies are the last agencies that would be impartial in adjudicating you know, their own rules and their own enforcement policies. They're biased as could be. And the Supreme Court has upheld their neutrality as long as they don't make stupid statements and clearly indicate a bias uh, expressly. Uh, anyway, that's, I, I think, a companion problem that needs to be addressed. So, uh... Look, we've got three people uh, lined up here, but before we jump to that, uh, I want to get to um, uh, Tim Worth. Is, I see Tim's on. Um, uh, Tim brought the whole emergency powers issue uh, uh, to the fore um, during the last uh, <clears throat> uh, election. And we we had a separate salon, and so the emergency powers was is a subset of of delegation doctrine, and so we decided to go ahead and do the emergency powers uh, separately from. Now this this uh, salon is is much broader, but Tim, do you want to uh, uh, jump in here on on uh, the emergency powers and how you uh, were so worried about it uh, before, and are, are you as worried about it now? Um, as you were during the last administration? This can be used and abused at any time. And, and uh, anyway, but that, this is all a very nice discussion, but let me talk about what the, talk about a broader remedy and that's having a responsible Congress. You know, there is no way that anything like this can be dealt with if you have the Congress that is there a day and a half a week you know, going, they're, they're never, they don't, they don't know each other. They don't, there's no expertise that members of Congress develop. There's no regular order of developing a legislative process. Campaign finance just buries everything. So that as was pointed out earlier, people are just concerned about raising money for their next campaign. And uh, we, you, you agreed not to do the War Powers Act, but that's the most egregious example of all of this, or is certainly among the most egregious examples of all of this. You know, until a leadership in some fashion decides that uh, it wants to return to uh, at least trying to get the Congress to be a responsible entity, nothing like nothing's going to happen. Uh, I, I don't think you can. The court may make a number of rulings, but. Uh, 
the Congress isn't isn't able to just simply is not capable of responding, nor does it want to respond. There aren't very many people up there who are interested in doing this. I mean, it's it's a real it's it's a it's a fundamental leadership problem, I think. And uh, uh, you talk about the the uh, emergency powers, just one part of this, uh, John. I'm glad you're having this. I don't agree with a lot of what Boyden said, obviously, but I mean, I, uh, I I appreciate you know his thinking about it, and I appreciate the fact that he's kind of putting the lash to the Congress in a way, in in the way that has to be done. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a, 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 a you can you got to put this delegation problem at the feet of of, of both political parties. Uh, you know, there's. No question this, about this, it. Yeah, I mean, this isn't Democrat versus Republican here at all. I mean, this has been a everybody's Congress ducking. Been, they're all ducking responsibility. They don't have any responsibility. They can sort of rail away and send out press releases, go home and raise money, and never be around to, to legislate. I mean, it's a it's a rare phenomenon. Anyway, I'm, I'm I'm I come out of a different history of uh, you know the Congress worrying about the FCC and. You know, <laughs> worrying about you know what what, what in fact we were gonna, what in fact we were going to try to do I mean it was and how do you how do you think how do you deal with AT and T and how do you deal with the cable industry I mean those are really complicated issues you know largely dealt with by the by the Congress and that's where they belong. Can I respond a bit on that because that's why the the whole non delegation sure. problem is brought to the fore um, because if if the courts should start um, a congressional enactment uh, because it gave too much power to the administrative agencies, um, Congress would feel it's got to start legislating. If it wants to pass legislation, it's not going to get credit for that legislation if the court keeps striking it down. And so I, I can't think of another way that you can get Congress to behave properly, but that's certainly one of well, I certainly hope that that was the case. I just you know, I, I, I cut my up. teeth and all of this with Bruce Fine what, 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I, I think that uh, the court will say, listen, Congress can take back the power anytime it wants. It's a, more of a political question otherwise, and we're not going to step in. But I did want to ask this question, too. Um, you remember the line item veto case, Clinton versus New York, where the Supreme Court held Congress could not delegate line item veto to the president. What's the difference in your judgment between the theory of that ruling and the non-delegation issue you're hoping the Supreme Court will adopt in the West Virginia case? Are you talking to me? Um, is that for me, Bruce? Well, you or Boyden, any response would be welcome. Oh, well, uh, I think that's a perfectly good example of what, how a, a, a Supreme position striking down something like that legislation gets observed. It stopped. That whole idea was stopped. Now, maybe you don't agree with the idea, but um, the Supreme Court can stop legislation from happening if they don't believe that Congress has made the policy decisions that are necessary for that. I can understand why this happened with the line item veto, because there's nothing in the Constitution about that. Um, and, if, and if Congress wants that to happen, they'd have to amend the Constitution. But that's a different question. Well, how is there's anything, there's nothing in the Constitution about delegating legislative power to the executive either. In fact, Article 1, Section 1 says all legislative power under the Constitution uh, is entrusted to the Congress. Yes, and that's what that's that's why the non-delegation uh, provision works because all legislative power must be exercised by the Congress. It can't be exercised by anybody else. So the non-delegation doctrine is just a follow-on, uh, um, uh, a a principle that has to that has to be in place in order to. Uh, validate the separation of powers. The court said in 1935, the Supreme Court did that in two cases in 1935, struck down those major cases, including NIRA, because they did not, they gave too much power to the president. 
Yeah, and then immediately retreated and haven't spoken that way for a hundred right. years. I agree. I agree. But you have to have people with, what do they call them? Cajones? Okay. So we've got uh, uh, Ivan Edland and Todd Pierce. Why don't you, you got, both got your hand up. Let's uh, jump yeah, in Patrick here. Patrick Malloy from the congressional perspective. Yes, I have a. Okay, Pat, go so, ahead. You want me to do, go now? It doesn't matter. We're going to get to all three of you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, good to see Peter Walson. I haven't seen Peter in a long time, but a pleasure to see him. Um, I, I worked in, in state. I was in justice for eight years. I was on the Senate Banking Committee staff for 15 years. And then I was an assistant secretary of commerce under President Clinton for trade. And you, you, the discussion was how these agencies get captured. When I was on the Hill, if you went to work for a law firm or some group that was profiting from being knowing how the Congress and all it worked, they would call that selling out. Now the young people on the Hill call that cashing in. And I think it's also true in these agencies where people gain knowledge and then they go off and sell their knowledge on how to manipulate those agencies. And so why couldn't we at least take care of that problem by putting a law in that the people to stop this revolving door that's going on? And I think the generals are now doing it too, where they go off and work for these, uh, these uh, armaments firms and, and, and people like that. So I just wanted to throw that out and see if anyone thinks that's an idea and feasible. Well, Pat, you know, many members of Congress are a part of the revolving door, too. They serve. They yes, exactly. I agree with you. So, so the, why would they stop a practice that that they profit from? I just don't see that happening, you know, because they. I'm, you're saying it's a political problem, but I'm saying, is that a, is that is that worthwhile? If, if somebody wanted to push that as a political issue, can that be done? And does anybody think it would be good? Boyden, Boyden, jump in here, because you're you, you've thought a lot about that. About uh, what? About which? The revolving, about the revolving door problem. How, how well, that, is, that is one of the main problems we have. It's a problem both with the agencies. That's why I gave the example of Government Sachs. But it's also true of the Congress. They, uh, they take advantage of their prior positions and they, uh, and they then become lobbyists. Um, and um, for uh, you know, for hire, and that's a very debilitating, uh, destructive uh, uh, development. And it's uh, you know, is there a way to stop it? <clears throat> well, I think there are some ways to stop it, but Congress probably has to act to do it. And Congress is not about, in the present circumstances, to do anything to uh, chastise itself. But the revolving door is a is a is a cornerstone of this, of this, of this difficulty. And um, it's um, endemic throughout the entire government. Yes, I, 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 said I, at the, I said at the outset, just look at where all the admirals and generals go yep. after they. Exactly. So that's a key issue. Some, some group ought to really get onto that one. Yeah, but I, I hey, Pat, one, I think that the revolving door issue is in part anyway, a reflection of the fact that the government is so big yep. and it has such an impact on everyone's finance wealth that uh, the, the lobbyists are worth it. I mean, because, hey, if they can actually give you access, you know, your return on investment is huge. If the government doing so many things, there wouldn't be there. Well, the revolving door issue would be much more attenuated, even if it didn't go away. Yep. Ivan, you. you better jump in here. Or, uh, you guys yeah. are not going to. Uh, I just want, uh, we've been talking about all the legal aspects of this, but, you know, there seems to be the system is broken down at some point because the incentives of Congress are to pass broad laws so they can get credit for it. But then when the really difficult issues come along, they go, oh, well, the, ag the agency did that. We didn't put that in the law. That was, you'll have to go talk to EPA or OSHA or wh whatever <laughs> agency it is. But it seems to me you're alluding to some of the history of this, which I'm 
I, I know starts around 1935 of this non delegation, but I'm kind of un, uh, unaware of the details. I'm just wondering why did the system work for so long and then it started, it, it's deteriorated because the, the incentives of individual congressmen have deviated from the institutional in, incentive of, you know, legislating and getting as much power as you can. But the, the congressmen, their individual incentives are different. And I'm wondering how the, the, this got a skew because it, it diverts, it uh, diverges from what Madison originally uh, based the whole system on, and that is one branch would have the ambition and the incentive to push back a, and the other, and it's it somehow broken down. This is a, the, you know, this is a big problem, but how, how did the history of this occur? Can I jump in before Absolutely. Mark answers the question? I'm going to, I'm going to make a bipartisan little interjection, a little intervention here and say that, um, why the Congress has gone AWOL is, uh, I think, um, a combination of, of, of factors, but I want to give just one or two. Uh, the most important is Gingrich. He started the process of uh, pulling all the power into the leader's office, which yeah. you know, Nancy Pelosi has continued, and it's affected the Senate for both you know, McConnell and uh, Schumer. Uh, and so there's no regular order anymore. There are no markup sessions anymore. There are no, um, you know, I ask people when I give speeches about this topic, how many people here have heard of an amendment to the third degree? And there's nothing but, you know, what in the hell is this guy talking about? Well, <laughs> Tim would be familiar with an amendment to the third degree, but amendment to the third degree was you couldn't do it. You couldn't amend uh, uh, the, the, the operating documents you were uh, legislating on more than two times. And so it was a big, big problem. One man should be called in, you know, as a member of the third degree. And it's, it's just that's been lost. There are no markups. I said to these speeches, I said, these speeches, I said, how many of you have ever heard of a markup session or been to a markup session? No hand goes up. So there's no, there's no uh, legislation going on anymore. And that is because the speaker and the majority leader in the Senate have followed Gingrich's example of pulling everything into their offices. And we have what Nancy Pelosi said about the Affordable Care Act. We have to pass this in order to find out what's in it. You know, in, the, in, in this big, big uh, $3.5 trillion, you know, omnibus bill, the re, you know, the reconciliation bill, you know, Schumer was trying to get a vote on it in the Senate before the thing even had an outline, let alone text. Uh, so uh, it's that's that's where I think, and part of it is, Bruce referred to one of these, uh, I think mentioned this, it's, it's in the congressman's interest to leave it really a little unclear because then the interested parties have to go to the congressman who's on the relevant committee to ask to lobby the, um, the bureaucrats to get the result they want and the congressman is happy to oblige because he can exact a big campaign contribution. And I know this personally because one of the things that I suggested when President Bush was seeing his polls drop after the second, first Gulf War, I suggested that, that there be disclosure of congressional lobbying of the bureaucrats, just as there has to be disclosure of the private sector lobbying executive commission, executive branch bureaucrats. And so I said, you know, calls have to be logged that are made by a congressman or senator to someone in some agency to fix some problem that wasn't really articulated in the legislation. And it took about 60 seconds for Dan Quayle, the vice president, to get to my office and say, one more word about you from Gray, uh, from you, Gray, and you are fired. So obviously it was a sensitive topic for the, for the Senate, um, um, former senator, so this is a real problem, and I think it's it's. I'm glad Bruce raised this because I think it's 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 it's, it's in, in, instrumental in the congressional advocation because they collect incredible rents out of the vagueness of their of their legislation. 
Boyd and I, I just want to follow up on what you just said. Um, when I was in the Senate, we called the committees the engine rooms of the Senate because that's where, that's where the real work was done. Um, what's happened now when you put it in the leadership, instead of members, the elected members making the key decisions, the staff around the leaders make the key decisions as to what happens. And so again, it's taking power from the elected representatives of the people and shoving it into unelected people who then go off and sell their expertise to people who want to manipulate the system. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Yep. Yeah, there's Good. another so that comes into play too. Um, I don't know whether it's, it's not probably a Gingrich's um, brainchild here, but you know, it's notorious that the Congress itself divides its committees into three tiers based upon uh, how attractive they are in raising money. Uh, from the in industries they regulate. And they levy dues on anyone who wants to be a tier one committee. I think it's a little over $1 million you got to raise for the, the uh, congressional campaign. And so <laughs> it's, it's turned into a plutocracy. And if in the private sector, this would be extortion. Well, if you want to be on Ways and Means Committee or Banking Committee, you know, right, I get, you raise a million dollars and give it to uh, the party. I don't know whether it was that bad when Tim Wirth was in, uh, but this totally supports you know, the way in which a sensible legislative process would work, uh, whereby the people who sit on the committees would have at least some expertise and ability to draft legislation. <coughs> Notorious now that the vast majority of initial drafts of legislation are prepared in the executive branch, not in the Congress. Uh, the intelligence committees don't draft anything. It's all the intelligence committee gives them a draft and says, hey, you know, pass X. Maybe they change a comma or a semicolon. Uh, but Congress is a receptacle now. It's, it's kind of inverted the legislative process. The executive branch proposes, and then Congress kind of fiddles with it and ratifies. Todd, you better jump in here. Um, you're a yeah, JAG so, lawyer. So I'm, just a, I'm just a humble Minnesota country administrative law attorney with a small agency I worked for, did work for, called the Department of Defense. <laughs> and uh, with my primary work the last 10 years being with the Guantanamo Military Commissions, where the, uh, the executive branch uh, assumed ex uh, all the powers of government, the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch, all encapsulated in the Military Commissions Act, the uh, uh, War Crimes Act, the, the War Powers Act, etc. So, you know, if I hadn't been sitting down, I would have been knocked down when I heard John Yu's name mentioned as somehow taking a positive role in unrolling this or unraveling this. Uh, so I guess uh, my question would just be is how in the world do we, uh, number one, why has nobody mentioned unitary executive theory, which is the very ideology that the executive branch has all the power that there can possibly be in this government, uh, assumed you know, by an entire Republican party and unfortunately too much of the Democratic party. And, uh, and yet uh, nobody's paying attention to of its spillover effect. Uh, you know, what can be done by the executive branch when it comes to war, military detention, all these other things, of course can be done to any other area of government uh, in, in, in including uh, the, the agencies having uh, unreviewable discretion, for example. So perhaps uh, I know this was meant to be a discussion put off, but it's the elephant in the room. Uh, I don't know how it can ever be put off when it's the engine driving the train, unlike the, 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 the uh, cabooses that are the business enterprises and et cetera that comes under the effect of the you know, non-delegation power. Well, I think, I think uh, Boyden got it right when he identified Woodrow Wilson as, in some sense, the theorist um, behind the breakdown of separation. Because Don't, don't, don't forget Teddy Roosevelt. But well, well ahead, Wilson was the one who expressed, he said, you know, we don't, separation is bad because it prevents our really smart people who know how to run the world, the platonic guardians, from doing all this good. Uh, and so he thought separation of powers was an affirmative evil because brilliant people like him were checked in, uh, in, in coming up with uh, uh, the golden fleece, uh, with uh, uh, the magic wand. Uh, and that kind of attitude then uh, has persisted, I think, uh, in our uh, electoral culture, political culture, 
uh, and leads to where we are today. And very little, it's very difficult to get even public opinion you know, behind anything different uh, because the schools, the textbooks, they all teach that government is really smart and we don't want to put checks on the people who are going to save us from all our stupidities. Um, doesn't matter what the empirical record shows. And it's that kind of doctrine then that seeps in to the entire culture through the educational system. And, and through the military. Yeah, Todd, let me, let, let me, uh, Todd, let me address one thing you said. So basically I was, uh, all right, so we've had, uh, you know, the committee believes that war is our biggest problem and 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 so that you know the the war power is a delegation issue and and um in my introduction i i didn't say we weren't dealing with it we most of our salons deal with that it's just what we were doing in this salon is it's it's the other side of the coin it's the same coin right uh, uh delegation doctrine is the war power abroad it's uh called delegation doctrine here and 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 it's a fair criticism and you know maybe Peter um, uh, can address it. And it's, it, 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 you know, it, it's very difficult to, to make de these delegate, you know, to jump up and down about sector polling and Panama or finding a standardist delegation when it comes to home and then, you know, put a blind eye to, uh, you know, to the, you know, the largest empire in history. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it always astounds me that, that people, don't see that as this two sides of the same coin. So the, the attempt tonight was to, to focus on the domestic side of this problem, but it's a much bigger, just like the emergency powers is a subset of the delegation doctrine, the, 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 uh, the war power, is, the, 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 delegate, the domestic and the foreign, it's all one seamless large problem. Congress is not doing its job. And just to clarify, until John Yu's name was mentioned, I probably wouldn't have said anything, but whenever Yu's name is mentioned, you have to talk about unitary executive theory, just like when Cheney's name is mentioned. I agree completely, with, you know, representative words. Well, Bruce is Bruce is debated. Bruce has debated uh, John Yu for how many years now? You you well, uh, at the War College? About eight or ten years at the National Defense University. But I think that um, the whole idea of unitary executive is. One that was born because at the Constitution Convention, there were proposals to have a plural executive. Unitary wasn't to mean that all the power was in the executive. It was simply that insofar as the president would be accountable for the executive branch actions, he had to have authority to fire people who were necessarily you know, on his wagon. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair to hold them accountable for uh, what uh, his administration was able to accomplish. So unitary really meant only that when the executive speaks, should be able to speak with one voice, but not that it has to speak on all the issues. It's been distorted to mean unitary executive means you know, it's ubiquitous power everywhere. Right. Uh, but unitary in the Madisonian sense was simply, you've got to hold the president accountable and therefore he has the right to discharge people who are exercising executive functions uh, to the extent they are executive, but it wasn't intent to say that all functions are executive. Um, on the on the unitary executive issue, the Supreme Court has now eliminated um, most of the problems there uh, by by uh, saying that a person cannot be appointed to an executive office uh, without uh, being relieved by the president for no cause at all. Um, and con what Congress had been doing is appointing people for years and couldn't be like to an independent agency and they couldn't be removed by the president unless they had done something wrong. Um, but that's all been eliminated now. The Supreme Court has been taking the unitary executive position and, um, and now the executive, no one can be appointed for a term of years uh, and not be removable. Well, that's not completely true, Peter. I was at the FCC. I can guarantee you the, the FCC commissioners, the SCC commissioners, the uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, which is the Humphreys executive case, the that statute been, for cause. Uh, Bruce, that, the Supreme Court changed that in the SELA case. They, <laughs> they, say, they took out that authority from... Uh, but that was because but they, they said it was... 
they said the C. They said it was a single member agency, unlike the independent agencies. I'm not saying the rationale holds, but no, they did not overrule Humphrey's executor, which is what they would have had to do to achieve what you've described. They did in the Sela case. They overruled Humphrey's executor. Well. <laughs> Look, look at this. Up, is as a, they say. This, this is a good illustration. <laughs> this is a good illustration of how technical uh, delegation doctrine can, you know, quickly uh, degenerate into a lawyer's uh, uh, dialogue. But uh, Mike Peabody, you've been silent tonight. Mike uh, started uh, issue one, and, and Mike's been very concerned about um, uh, <clears throat> Congress being for sale, and and. Um, the the you I think you recently hosted a, um, a third party uh, platform because the the two parties haven't really addressed the run on you know Democratic and Republican candidates don't run on how they're going to exercise the eighteen enumerated powers that they're given. Um, is is your third party um, candidate going to do that? Is there, are they going to run on the Constitution? Are they going to run on policy, on, on, on process rather than policy? Can somebody pull that? Is anybody good enough to pull that off? Mike, you're, you're on mute there. It looks like Mike's frozen there. I don't know what. Okay, we'll go on. Uh, I see we have uh, David uh, Schiffler was on. David, you're a you're a, you've written a lot about uh, the Constitution, American politics. Uh, do you want to say weigh in here? Okay. Hi, hi, John. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not on the screen, but well, this is a fascinating discussion. Of course, I'm not as well schooled as all of you in legal issues. But looking at the, trying to look at it in a practical way, I'm, I'm left uh, with a big question, which is, uh, I mean, I understand the principles you're talking about, but what's the practical solution when you have a complex modern society with a big government that has to administer uh, and uh, administer complicated laws? I mean, where, where are the lines uh, between what's constitutionally permissible uh, and what is not. I mean, you can't obviously have regulatory agencies or any administrative agencies in the executive branch that have no authority to apply the laws. So how do you, how do you work that out? I'm, I'm kind of left with that great big question that I don't think has been answered in this discussion. Right. Um, you know, Woodrow Wilson talked a lot about complexity, and complexity is always the argument that people pull out who want standardless delegation. But we've got Boyden here. Why don't you weigh in on this? You thought, what do you think of the complexity argument? You can hide a lot of sins behind that, can't you? Yeah, you can, you can hide anything behind that. But uh, I would just cite John Dingle, who taught me a lot. I was young enough to be his son, not his grandson, his son. He was chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House when I first got involved with all this regulatory stuff. And uh, he, he was very uh, specific about it. He would not delegate an ounce of discretion to the EPA that he did not absolutely have to do. He didn't trust them. He wanted to have it in the legislation. I worked with him very closely on the 1990 Amendments to the Clean Air Act. It was a joy to behold his, his attention to detail, his commitment to, uh, to uh, the rule of law. This is, you know, I mean, and it worked. He showed how it could work. The problem is, you know, uh, Tim Worth left the Senate too early for reasons that we could understand because it was falling apart then, the Senate was. But there are no John Dingles or Tim Worths left on either in either party. That is a, a big, uh, that's a big gap. And I hope the Supreme Court can shame, will shame the Congress into, um, into its own responsibilities. 
But that's all I can say about this. That's all I can say. Well, well that's a very the... interesting perspective, and that was brought up earlier about the the fact that the if the court were to move in this direction aggressively. You know, would that shame the Congress? And would that give us the opportunity to return to those days of real legislation? I mean, the Commerce Committee was legislating under John Dingell, and he drove those subcommittees to legislate. It was a great process. And, you know, Pat remembers that. I, I, I also had the privilege of being on the Armed Services Committee when Sam Nunn was the chairman. And it was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary group of people that Sam put together, and they were very careful stewards you know, of the of uh, that mammoth budget as good as you could possibly be. I mean, nobody's even begun to deal deal with that in the same way. But there are these people who were deeply committed and very, very strong individuals and powerful politicians and believers in the Constitution. And uh, we can take uh, I think we can take heart from the fact that we have those in our very recent memory. Dingle and Nunn are very recent, very recent memories. And, uh, you know, people can be. Uh, People can be encouraged and 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 uh, and can be can move into that kind of in, into that kind of situation. I mean, I I, can, I think it's possible, but it's not going to happen if it if the Congress is there for a day and a half a week and and uh, all it does is raise money. Yeah, I think there are a of, uh, possible approaches that are variations here. One, uh, the Congress could delegate authority to propose statutes to experts. They could. And that the Congress would vote up or, or amend it uh, if they're just seeking expertise. Although I don't see why Congress has all the authority in the world to get all the expertise they want. They just subpoena them. They, 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 it's stupid that they, the staff is so downsized. Uh, maybe it's because leadership doesn't want them. But you know, the Congress now is filled with staff that are 25 years old and know nothing. Yeah. Um, so they don't have the intellectual infrastructure even to write the bills, but you could delegate at least the drafting process to, to the experts and then present it to Congress. Another, at least partial uh, approach uh, is to restore the legislative veto. I think the Supreme Court got it wrong in Chada in suggesting that at least this was a way in which if Congress gives away some of its authority, it at least has some check, one or two house vetoes. Uh, so at least you have some greater accountability uh, from the Congress in the regulations that come out of the executive branch in great number. But there are a couple of that, it's not a complete cure all, but I think it's a partial uh, remedy. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's, eight, it's uh, past 830 and uh, Boyden, do you wanna have the last word here and, and then we'll, uh, we'll, con we'll close, you know, the closing statement. Uh, no, 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 nothing really profound. I just think that um, Congress will respond to uh, a shaming event. And that, I probably agree with Peter on this, that probably depends on the court taking the first step. The court can't solve it, but it can maybe trigger it. And I think, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that we'll see... Um, a lot, a lot come out if the court acts uh, on these issues as they should and as they, you know, I, I, I don't write off as a Republican, I don't write off to a Republican, yeah, Republican, I've never, I never got elected to dog catcher or anything, but I'm not sure that even Steve Breyer would disagree with, with uh, a lot of the sentiments that have been, that have been uttered tonight, so, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, and I think we will get through this. We've gotten through worse in the past, and I think we'll get through this. Well, thank you, Boyden. Uh, we appreciate everything you've done for the committee from the beginning, and I uh, uh, appreciate uh, what you did tonight. Uh, it was a great discussion, and it's one that we're going to continue because uh, we're not, you know, we can't make uh, America great again unless Congress is great again. and. Uh, they've got to do their job, and, and it's a big job. Madison made it such a difficult job that it's understandable what people don't want to do uh, the hardest job in the world. Uh, but if you actually do exercise all those 18 powers, then it is the hardest job in the world, and uh, we've got to make it the hardest job in the world again. People are uh, running like crazy. People want to get that job. They're running all, all kinds of people are running for that job. You know, it's, uh, 
uh, you know, how, how do you instill them with the idea that the job comes with some responsibility? Responsibility. You gotta, you gotta do the job. The eighteen. You got to do your. Got to do your eighteen missions. Well, thank, you you, get, thank you, Boyden. Thank you, Boyden. Get candidates to do it. Thank you, Boyden. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All. Thanks, Tim. Good discussion. Take care, Peter. Yeah. Okay, Pat. Take care. Yeah. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.